the fastest passenger train ever in recorded human history. The L-00 series Shinkansen is a technological marvel culminated from over 50 years of Japanese bullet train history. On April 21st, 2015, while some people were playing around with pipes filled with hype, this magnetic levitating train set a Guinness world record speed of 375 miles per hour. Just shy of 400 miles per hour, this train is already capable of taking passengers and will open for public exhibition during the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. But what if I told you this technology didn't have to stay exclusive to Japan? Here in America, our rail infrastructure has lagged behind the rest of the world as slow trains, decrepit bridges, and ancient tracks plague our potential nationwide. Despite this, America is home to one of the world's busiest rail corridors, the Northeast. Washington DC, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston. The throne of the world's economic, educational, and political power is currently served by this aging infrastructure. So what if we took that to the next level? What if we could bring the fastest train in history to the United States of America? What if you could get from DC to NYC in only one hour? This is the goal of the Northeast Maglev, a project that promises just that. On this episode of the American Rail Club, we will be interviewing one of the head visionaries, Project Director David Henley, who will be guiding us through the actions, planning, and possibilities that Maglev trains will bring to America. Grab your ticket, sit back, and enjoy the ride. Yeah, this is for real. Before we embark, check out our video putting to rest the hype in the Hyperloop. It's the most watched episode we've had yet at over 262,000 views as of the beginning of March. Thanks to your support, we've been able to begin bringing the message to the masses thanks to CBS 8 in San Diego, which featured yours truly on the news. Some experts doubt a Hyperloop system will ever be built in the United States. Believe me, I think the Hyperloop is actually inferior technology to what we already have. Demetrius Villa is the president of the American Rail Club, which advocates for high-speed rail systems. He says current maglev technology can push trains more than 300 miles per hour. And he says there are safety concerns with Hyperloop systems, including earthquakes and terrorist attacks. If you have one part of the system that um, has an attack, or let's say there's a leak, the whole system goes down. Virgin Hyperloop 1 did not respond to News 8's request for comment. Keep this train going by supporting us on Patreon, and you can get exclusive gear and access to the American Rail Club. Now, let's begin. Hello everyone, it's me, Demetrius Villa, your host and the president and founder of the American Rail Club. We're here with a very special guest today from the Northeast Maglev Project. We have David Henley here. Hello David, how you doing? I'm very well, Demetrius. Thank you for having me. Alright, perfect. So if you guys have been following this project, this is your video right now because we're actually going to go in depth and learn about this and the massive amount of opportunity it's going to bring to the Northeast because um, my thoughts are this is probably the biggest project if it really gets done. This is really going to change the way America moves over. Uh, so David, t tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved um, with this. Okay, I've been hearing about this project for a number of years. A colleague of mine's been very closely involved as the chief engineer. So she's basically been keeping me up to date. I was living in New York. I was the head of uh, capital planning and budget for New York City Transit at the time. And um, she would give me updates every now and then, and uh, I thought it was a very fascinating project. And then one day she called and said, hey, listen, uh, they need a project director. And I said, wow. Uh, she goes, would you move down to Baltimore? And I said, well, yeah, I think I would move down to Baltimore. <laughs> and so that became the genesis of it. Three, it'll be three years in July. So it's a fascinating project. And all the work that I had done to date in my career it may not be suggestive that 
I'd be the right person, but I think I am the right person. Okay, perfect. So tell us a little bit now, because there may be some people right now looking at this on YouTube right now and seeing, you know, what what is this? What is Northeast Maglev? Uh, what is it supposed to do for for the region? Okay. Well, the, first of all, the Northeast Corridor is the issue. It's uh, uh, the thread that, that connects Baltimore, I'm sorry, uh, Boston, all the way down to uh, Washington, D.C. Um, mega, mega important region. Uh, it's only 2% of the landmass area, but one out of uh, $5 is generated in this corridor. 17% of the population of the United States lives here. And yet all these communities or cities in between these commercial centers are disconnected. So that's the problem statement. There's the highways, the, the, uh, the railways, and even the airports are under serving this territory in historically um, uh, poor ways, dysfunctional ways. So the, the, the goal is, has always been to be able to connect up these, uh, these cities in a way that's quick, efficient, and time sensitive. And that's been something that's been thought about for decades. And this project came along about eight years ago. It had been refined over 50 years, this technology, but actually then got deployed in, in uh, Japan, which is the busiest rail corridor in the world between uh, Tokyo and Osaka. The second busiest is the Northeast Corridor. So the linkage between East versus West or East, east meets, meets West was uh, pretty obvious. So um, the discussions with the uh, Jap Japan Rail Central started about eight years ago. They are looking to market their, uh, their, their technology. We're looking to improve the Northeast Corridor's transportation network. And so that's how it all came to be. Uh, and our business plan right now is to go from Washington, D.C. to New York. And we can do that in one hour, with one cool. stop in Philadelphia. But the first step, we're you know we have to start um, locally, and that is to go from Washington D.C. to Baltimore with one stop at BWI Airport, and that would be in 15 minutes uh, between Baltimore and D.C. And anybody that lives in this region knows that would be a phenomenal uh, advantage to people living in this area, It'd be a game changer. You cannot go to to D.C. in less than an hour on any mode that you want to try. So getting there in 15 minutes between those two cities would be a game changer. Absolutely. And that's, that's that it's incredible to when you think of it that way, because when people say, you know, how we're going to get from one place to another, the first thought is always, you know, the car. The problem is everybody's all stuck on the highways. You have induced traffic on there. So everybody is still stuck going at the snail's pace, going from one city to another. The only other explanation or the only other way to get through um, is through rail if you want because everybody would be going on through jets and that's physically impossible in order to get everybody through there so trains are the best way to get that through capacity and this one in particular this superconducting maglev that the Japanese have been developing for over 50 years now uh, the last top speed record they did was over 375 miles an hour that's with people inside um, that's not that's not a hyperloop or anything like that this is this is for real yeah, people don't understand that. This is for real. So we're actually showing some video right now. If you guys are watching, um, these are, these are like actual real videos that BBC has taken and everything else. This is a real deal technology that actually exists, and we have the capabilities to actually build this over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So as you say, it's a proven technology. It's been certified safe. It's gone through the EIS hurdles. It's being constructed. Uh, the, there's a 175 mile uh, uh, length between Tokyo and Nagoya that's underway right now, tunneling through the Japanese Alps. That takes a long time. So it'll be 2027 before the actual complete right of way is established and operable. But right now there's a 30 mile uh, length that's in operation and hundreds of thousands of people have ridden it. Uh, you have to join a lottery to get a ticket on it. Uh, it's very, very popular. And uh, yeah, moving it here is the challenge. The technology's there. 
now we also have to bring the discipline and the culture of on-time performance to this country. Right. It's the only way this will work. You, you can have the technology, but unless you're utilizing it in a way that makes sense um, and have on-time performance unparalleled, uh, then, then it's just not going to be a success. So we're bringing the technology and we're going to uh, bring the culture of uh, discipline for getting things on time. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned about the discipline because when we did um, our trips over to Japan, we seen what was going on over there. The the process, the system that they had set up, because it's not just the train. It's everything else that goes in to make sure that transportation system is successful and gets people moving along. I mean, the the amount of time it takes to them to get into there, to get everything set up, to clean up the trains. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody has seen those videos where they just clean up an entire 13-car train in seven minutes. That's, right. that's it's inc- military operation. It's just it's amazing. I know. I mean, it's it's incredible. But like that clockwork is what meshes in to make this successful. And bringing that in is, you know, you can have the technology and everything else. But without the system working and the process going through there, it, it does it won't work. Yes, it's it's part and parcel of the same thing. So that's going to be the that's going to be the challenge is not only the construction of it, which is huge. This project, just the link between Washington uh, D.C. and Baltimore, that's that's only that's less than forty miles, but thirty miles of it's going to be tunnel, and the other. Uh, 10 miles or so will be viaduct. So it's going to be the biggest public works project going on in this country once it starts. We're going to have seven to eight tunnel boring machines all working at the same time to dig up and 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 put in a, a concrete line tunnel. At the same time, we got to build three stations, two of which will be very deep, one in uh, downtown D.C., one under like BWI Airport, and then hopefully an elevated station at uh, uh, at uh, in Baltimore, Southwest Baltimore. The the thing about it is, you know, because this region, this territory, is so busy and so dense with activity, and and a lot of that activity are you know Federal Reserve lands. You know, we have people like uh, the the uh, the NSA, the uh, Secret Service, we have uh, Re- Refugia, the Patuxent Refuge, the um, Beltsville Agricultural Research Center. So a lot of a lot of preserved lands. We got to thread this very fine needle through a very complicated uh, territory and doing it do it in a way that is least impactful for everybody that's involved. So that's this this uh, environmental impact statement is taking a bit longer than we had anticipated but it's not surprising because there is a lot of there's a lot of activity going on here and we have a lot of stakeholders that have to be dealt with in a very upfront and honest manner so that's at the end of the day we want to be good neighbors so Absolutely. To be good neighbors, we want to do it right Right, and I'm glad you mentioned about uh, the environmental impact study because I know when I spoke in through uh, two different rail companies now being built, for example, in Texas or Brightline right now that's been going on, a lot of the top members and the executive members, they've been saying and saying that the EIS study is unneededly long and for especially for something that would be already environmentally better than what what the government's building right now, road. So do, do you have the same sort of sentiment? Do you feel it's sort of delaying the progress or could it be streamlined better um, and a lot of red tape cut out in order to make this work? Well, the, the issue is that because there are so many players in this, uh, this location, there's 30 different agencies, okay. county, state, federal, all of whom have a piece of this project, uh, rightfully or not. That's just the process. Um, obviously, we would like things to move more quickly, but understanding that it is, you know, this is a new technology for this country. Right. This is a very complicated territory to be putting it into. Um, so we want to make sure it gets done right and getting 
done right means you know a, a little bit of schedule is is sacrificed. Well, that's that's the trade off that uh, we're making. Hopefully, the lessons learned from this experience will meet going further north a lot easier. So we'll be able to take those lessons and apply them as we go for further north Absolutely. and make, make that process a little bit more quickly. Correct. Yeah. And once people are able to see now and able to actually get on there and experience this in operation, it makes it a lot easier to go ahead and finalize it and, you know, be able to prospect and saying, oh, this can be able to go ahead all the way to New York. Yeah. And I'm fully expecting once cities like Philadelphia and New York see what's happening here, they're going to be clamoring for it. Absolutely. So currently, right now, what is the process um, getting this built right now? Because I know you've currently said that it's going through the EIS study and you've been going with these different agencies right. in order to get this going. Right. Yeah, but approximately two months from now, the preferred alignment will be identified and then it will go out to the agencies in June of this year to to understand, okay, this is the final preferred alignment. What are our issues? What are the impacts on our properties? What are the things that will need to be done to mitigate or avoid um, the impacts? All of that process will continue in to the fall and then there'll be public hearings uh, all up and down the state and in DC and in Baltimore to get public comments. That's all part of the process. And then probably uh, August of next year, 2020, we'll have a record of decision by the Federal Railroad Administration, which is the final approval allowing this project to go forward in Maryland and DC. And uh, the construction can begin shortly after that. Wow. Uh, so, you know, assuming we get all our permitting and all the financing put together, it could be, you know, as early as late 2020 or early 2021. 20, uh, so that's basically the schedule as it's uh, as it's configured right now. OK. And then for operation between D.C. to Baltimore, when do you expect that will be able to start? Well, assuming we can begin in 20, let's say late 2020, it's about a seven year construction uh, schedule and a year of that is actually testing and commissioning the the final service uh, so we'll run it in operation without passengers uh, for at least a year testing uh, and commissioning and, and getting right everything getting all the bugs out right uh, so that would that would put us at the latter part of 2027 early 2028 uh, basically on par with the schedule for Japan so if Japan opens and we open at the same time, East meets West, that would be beautiful, I think. That, yeah, that would be incredible. I know for sure Japan has been really pushing this through because the minute um, once the current president now, President Trump, once he went into office and was starting in, the first person that met with him was Prime Minister Shinzo Abe from Japan. And exactly. when they had their joint meeting back um, over in February of uh, 2017, the first thing Shinzo Abe mentioned was the maglev to get from D.C. over to New York. Yes. And, you know, we're very grateful for the support of the Japanese government. Um, they've been a steadfast uh, ally on this project. So things like that, you know, just going very public at the highest level is very, very healthy for this project. <laughs> As they would say, gone but the, you know, we got to get to get this done. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, yeah, and you've mentioned uh, JR Central is really heavily involved with this project. So, oh, yeah. to what what extent are they involved in? Well, they they're the ones that gave us the the operative uh, criteria for defining uh, the uh, the alignments, the the uh, all the the necessary attributes of operating the system have to be based on their 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 experience. So right. um, all the alternatives that were studied as part of the EIS, the foundation of those being established was JRC's operating criteria. So in technical criteria, so uh, we're working with them on a daily basis in terms of uh, keeping them informed of where our activities are and and they tweak things like we're, we're very actively involved right now in uh, establishing a yard operation, a rail yard operation. 
and defining where where and how that is set up in terms of the frequency of service uh, uh, repairs and what 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 is going to be done on the the alignment at night the nighttime operations and how those are uh, configured so very active involvement they're going to be involved forever in this project so um, we're uh, very grateful for their experience and their guidance oh that 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 is incredible you know the amount of it and and, and people need to understand because i i think especially right now well i don't think i know for sure that a lot of us have been getting uh sidetracked um especially when it comes to other projects or other distractions such as the hyperloop and yeah. we've already put that out there the last video we did on debunking the hyperloop um is already shot up to two hundred thousand views so people are starting to to figure that out so I, I think it needs to go it has to be up to us with people who are actually pushing real projects with real solutions we need to be out there and really showcasing that this is something that is working is has been in operation in japan and can definitely be brought over here so i, I want to hear from you david uh, what is it that makes this project really the the real necessary project that's necessary for the northeast corridor apart well, from the competition yeah uh, you're absolutely spot on in terms of that it's what it is is it's long been recognized that you know given the deficiencies of the the highway and the rail connections and their impact on the the aviation industry because of the, those deficiencies that a new model has to be in place and this is this is the 1960s study from uh, the federal government identified this as a necessary thing in this corridor right. so all we're doing is we have the solution we just have to figure out how to implement it. And the, the, uh, the game change net, uh, aspect of this is well recognized that once people get adapted to certain travel, their livelihoods are gonna change. The possibilities of working in one place and living in another place become uh, just you know, exploitable. So you'll be able to you'll be able to live in Baltimore or uh, work in New York, that sort of thing, and vice versa. So uh, the the fact is, we need to have another way of doing business between all the different uh, capital cities in this in this area. These you know, Philadelphia needs to expand. Uh, Baltimore needs to expand. The, the weight, the the underlying component that will allow all that to happen is fast, certain travel. And the thing about it is we want to we also want to be linked with the airports. So part of our business plan is we're going to be linked with BWI Airport, uh, the airport in Philadelphia, the airport in uh, Newark. So all of these cities you'll be able to buy a ticket and the ticket will be a fast train to Philadelphia. The ticket to from Philadelphia to Paris and back will all be linked uh, as, as part of your now integrated travel plan. So that is uh, one of the aspects that we think is going to not only help um, the, the, uh, the, 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 rail industry in terms of linkage with the airports but also the airport industry uh, allowing them to focus on more longer uh, uh, leg trips as opposed to these short haul flights which which the current dysfunctionality of highways and railways is uh, is is feeding into that dysfunctionality no one in europe or no one in japan takes a, a plane to fly 200 miles from dc to uh, say new york that's unheard of they would just get on a fast train and so allowing dis you know just eliminating those short haul flights is going to be huge in terms of allowing the airports to operate more efficiently and environmentally friendly, because those are the most uh, environmentally dis uh, destructive type flights there are. Absolutely, yeah, and that's, that's understandable. I know a lot of people have gotten confused, especially when the whole Green New Deal came out. And yeah. I, I can agree with them, you know, I'm, I'm probably 
much more fiscally conservative when it comes to rail than probably anybody else in the industry. But it's not about taking away options. It's right. about adding options. And this has worked in countries, for example, like as we keep saying, Japan, where the market share for rail, um, anything under 500 miles, 600 miles, that's that's where rail really shines, especially high speed rail. And, and, and environmentally, I mean, this is like the greenest project imaginable. Absolutely. I mean, Mass transit already is God's, you know, God's work, if you will. You know, you're already doing the work. You're already doing good things if you're moving lots of people much more efficiently. But getting them out of their cars is is the major uh, uh, plus side of this. Is because exactly. that is a huge in terms of if if people are, uh, are driving less, that's less pollution in the air, that's less wear and tear on the infrastructure, that's more productive use of their time. Absolutely. So that I mean that's a healthy aspect. Even if people aren't taking the trains, they're going to enjoy the benefits of cleaner air, a, a better economy because this is going to have all kinds of spin-off effect in terms of transit-oriented development and jobs for people. Absolutely. It, I mean the productivity uh, rate, yeah, over yeah, right now we don't have a career path in this country for people to be involved in high-speed train. That is this project. This project, you will be, a, you, know, you can begin and end your career all through the Northeast Corridor. This, this project is going to take seven years of construction, and then we're going to be going on to the next leg and the next leg. So you'll be able to follow this train on a career path all the way up to New York. So that I think, and, and, then, and then the permanent jobs that are associated with all of this is going to be huge. So in terms of the environment, in terms of jobs and what it's going to do, the economy is just, um, it's, you know, without, uh, without boundaries. Absolutely. And, and that's been proven. I mean, there's a reason why China has been able in the last 10 years to go ahead and build up their country from being just 17 miles from Beijing to Tianjin within the span from 2008 to 2018, 2019. They've built more than twice the amount of high speed rail in the, in the world. And they've what has happened is, according to the World Bank, their productivity has gone up in places like the Guangdong uh, region. Uh, by 10%. I mean, if, if anybody were to know that there was something they can go ahead to boost up their productivity and GDP by 10%, I mean, who wouldn't want to be jumping on that idea? Exactly right. So, you know, the, the technologies here, we need to bring that culture, as we talked about at the beginning here. Absolutely. All of those need to happen in order to get the what you're uh, alluding to in terms of productivity. That is the end result. That's the biggest benefit of all. Exactly. Perfect. Well, David, is there anything else that you would love to leave the, the viewers with about this project and the vision it's going to bring, uh, not just for the present, but also for the future generations? Because that's, that's the important part is getting the future on board with this and making sure our country is going in the right direction. What, yeah. would, what would you leave the viewers with? I, I would say, you know, understand what the project is. Um, go on our website, look at what it is. Go on JRC's website, look at what it is. And then start imagining the, how the Northeast Corridor would function, change, and improve with it here. We Over the last... Uh, almost three years, uh, I've noticed a you know decidedly different tone and um, and impression from people. Where you know three years ago there was like you know what is this and they were suspicious and they were concerned. Now now that people are better understanding it, I'm seeing a, a shift toward okay this could work and and I'm getting that mostly from younger people that are now looking at this as yeah why why haven't we done this we deserve this you know this this is something that's going to to make our life a lot better why shouldn't we be going in this direction exactly i'm i'm getting that shift and i think that's healthy and it's one you know once we get underway in terms of the construction we need to build on that momentum and just make sure that we keep going northward on a very predictable schedule absolutely perfect and how how if there's anybody in this region what's the best way for them to get involved with this 
Definitely go on our website at bwrr.com and and basically um, get involved. Just send us a you know message through the through the uh, website or contact us directly. There's the all our phone numbers. The contact info is on the online. So uh, that I think is the best way. Uh, write us and, and let us know what your questions are. We do a lot of mentoring with local schools um, and even schools not even in the state. Um, so I like to get uh, people involved at their earliest stages because this is, I say, a multi-generational project. So I want people to be in this country to be invested in this project. Absolutely. Oh, perfect. David, it's been a pleasure. We wish you guys the best of luck with this project and we'll absolutely keep in touch with this and keep following this and keep sharing with the viewers the great work that you guys are doing to make this happen and make this work because I firmly do believe that once this project gets going and gets go uh, on its uh, on the rails and moving, it's really going to be a major boost to the country. Thank you, Demetrius, and I really appreciate your support. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you all for writing. If you enjoy the content we bring to you, be sure to subscribe to ARC by clicking subscribe and pull that bell. Do you know someone who wishes they could get between DC and New York in only one hour? Share this video with them. It's no cost and everyone is welcome aboard. Support ARC further by upgrading your ticket to ride by supporting us on Patreon, where just a dollar will get you access to exclusive videos and behind the scenes before the general public. Thank you for your support. Next stop, the future.